people trickle in with their lunches. Um, so my name is Molly Bruce, and I'm the president of the Environmental Law Society here at Duke. Um, Co-sponsoring this event today, I just like have to give a shout out and much thanks to Duke's um, Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, um, specifically Reich and Michelle. Yes. Um, and Duke's chapter of the Federalist Society and Michael Wajda, where, wherever he is, um, as well as Duke's uh, chapter of the American Constitution Society and Isaac Earnhardt. Um, if everyone could also make sure at the when you, when we're done to not leave your trash underneath your seat, that would be wonderful. Um, so I would also like to thank our our panelists today. We have um, Professor Jedediah Purdy of the Law School, um, as well as Professor Ernest Young. Um, and they're going to be speaking about the different nuances of the Juliana v. United States case coming out of the Ninth Circuit. Um, so in, in 2015, uh, a group of youth plaintiffs sued the, the government, not under a, any particular statute, but based on the claim that the government's affirmative actions that have contributed to climate change are a constitution constitutional violation of the right to life, liberty, and property. And they also asserted under the public trust doctrine uh, that the government's required to maintain um, certain natural resources for the benefit of future generations and that, um, that the atmosphere should be included in this list of natural resources. Um, and so today we're kind of going to unpack this case um, and talk about standing. We're going to talk about the merits of the case, and we're also going to talk about um, potential remedies. Um, and also, before we really get going, um, I want to mention that the Duke's Environmental Law and Policy Clinic is also carrying forward um, a, a climate change-based suit and is representing youth plaintiffs. So that's kind of like a cool connection here right at Duke. And as we open up the room for questions, if anybody wants to pose questions to Professor Longest, um, he's more than able to speak to Duke's case. Yes. Um, and so without further ado, um, Professor Purdy, if you want to um, kind of give your take on the case before we proceed to like the moderated portion. Of Do you want to say a little more about the claims and the procedural posture of the case, Molly? Oh, man. Yeah. So the procedural oh, posture is quite complicated. Um, yeah. So the... So... You're talking about where we are right now? Just so that everyone has the same. Yeah, so maybe a week and a half ago, the Supreme Court allowed this case to continue in the Ninth Circuit, but then maybe um, on November 8th, um, there, um, there was a temporary stay of the case in the Ninth Circuit, and it looks like it'll proceed to trial, but it's kind of under um, much skepticism is where we are at this point. <clears throat> so, hi everyone. Um, I've been sort of surprised at how divided my own feelings have been about this case from the beginning. Um, in part because a lot of the um, research and writing I've done around environmental law um, have centered on the argument that if you look across a history of American law, not only but particularly, and that's what I know about, you'll find that the environmental statutes um, and institutions that we um, tend to take for granted now as normal law um, became possible only because at some point before they were normal law, activists and cultural innovators and others came up with radically new ways of talking about and relating to and valuing the natural world or parts of it, and made demands on political and legal institutions that were initially regarded as ridiculous or at least implausible. Uh, and so in environmental law, as in much else, like uh, constitutional law, the normal world that we live in today was built out of the impossible and utopian demands of earlier episodes. So that... Um, predisposes me in a very general way to like the idea of asking 
the U.S. government to do something that it's entirely um, disinclined to do through a novel set of constitutional and common law claims. And yet I've actually been fairly skeptical at, um, of the Juliana case um, all along. Um, and I think some of that may just be the uh, clash between the role of a historian of law and the role of a lawyer standing in the present and looking at what people whose who's, um, goals you're sympathetic to are um, and saying, you know, that might not, that might not work. That might backfire. Um, the historian can see what extraordinary things have had to be attempted in order for anything to succeed. The lawyer looking forward can see all the ways that a radical project in the moment could fail or backfire. And both are actually important sort of intellectual and, and, and even professional roles. And this is a very bold case. Um, the <clears throat> public trust argument that holds that the federal government has an obligation to preserve and caretake the global atmosphere is um, a, a pretty dramatic extension of and arguably departure from what um, public trust doctrine has tended to do. It has tended to exist at the level of the state rather than of the federal government. It has tended to be a limit on the privatization of a historically sort of cabined set of resources, especially uh, coastal um, waters and submerged lands. And so blowing it out into a general prescription um, for environmental caretaking um, is astonishing um, in, the, the, in the breadth and the boldness of the claim. The constitutional claim to a due process right to an environmentally sustainable <clears throat> future is also um, a claim of, of extraordinary boldness. Um, and hard to carry forward from even the bolder directions of constitutional interpretation of the last couple of decades, I'm inclined to say. And we can talk more about how it departs from the major lines of constitutional interpretation um, and intervention that the federal courts have been inclined to. So the <clears throat> main thing I want to say about this, and um, I'll wrap up in a couple of minutes, we can come back in more detail to these themes, is that I think we have to look at the Juliana case um, as political theater on the one hand. I think what the plaintiffs are trying to do is to a considerable extent to use the courts as a forum to try to change widely held attitudes about what people are entitled to, like a right to a viable future, about what the responsibility of a legitimate government is, like caretaking a um, a viable future. And from the point of view of those, the substance, the content, or the goals of those um, demands, I'm completely in sympathy. I think for everyone at the table is, is completely um, in sympathy. Um, political theater of this kind, and the move to the courts in particular, I think is especially um, understandable right now because people are operating with a fiercely felt sense of the gap between what needs to happen to avoid a whole series of acceleratingly <clears throat> catastrophic environmental developments and what is happening, which is um, almost complete inaction. Even the Paris Accords were totally inadequate in both in terms of substance and in terms of enforcement mechanisms and those have turned out, from the U.S. perspective, to be symbolic mostly um, for the um, political uh, theater of, of the Trump administration's repudiating them. So the feeling that there must be some institution that we can call on to make us better than ourselves and make us do something that we need to do but are manifestly not doing is a very understandable one. Americans have often turned to the courts in that circumstance. Um, so it's not surprising that it's happening again. I think, in fact, history tends to suggest that courts don't usually um, force 
Americans to be better than themselves. And when courts have been radically reformist and participated in, in deep social changes like during the civil rights movement, it's been in conjunction with the majoritarian political institutions like Congress and the presidency um, more than it has succeeded against them. So I think there's a kind of maximum tension right now between the kind of theatrical charisma and the moral admirability of this goal and its legal viability as a creditable use of the courts. And I'm um, concerned about where that's going to go. Um, it's great to see you all here. Thanks, thanks for coming, and thanks to the organizers for making it happen. Professor Young. So I want to thank Molly for roping me into this. Um, <laughs> Like most of the things I get dragged into, I've learned a lot. Um, I have a feeling I'm kind of cast as the Grinch on this panel, um, <laughs> that I'm here to say this isn't going to work. And, and in fact, I'm here to say that it's not going to work. Um, but I want you to understand where I'm coming from, um, which might surprise you. I don't know if it will or not. So I'm a conservative. Um, and what that means is I think change is basically bad. Um, <laughs> climate change is change. Um, therefore, I'm against it. Um, and, and, I, and I say I say that not just to be flip, although that's a side benefit, but the conservative worldview really is that the world is fragile and precious, and messing around with it is inherently dangerous. And we, if we do mess around with it, we have to be very, very careful because we just don't know all the bad things that can happen. And so while on the one hand, I think a conservative has to be pretty nervous about the sweeping new theories of constitutional law that are being advocated in this case, much more terrifying than that is the notion of climate change itself, right? It, it, it's going to change all our assumptions about how the world works in, in many, many ways. And so I frankly do not see how you can be a real conservative and not be really concerned about climate change and not be deeply in sympathy with the goals of a lawsuit like this. And, 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 and so I am. And if you still don't believe me, I will, I will take you out to the parking lot and I will show you my plug-in hybrid um, that I paid way too much for. Um, I, I'm, I'm serious about this. I, I would like to see um, a massive change in government policy in this direction. I just don't think um, this lawsuit is going to get here. And, and the first problem is standing. Um, so I think there's one, you know, just to, to say at the outset, I think there's one quick and relatively clean way in which this has to be dismissed on standing. Um, they have done a remarkable job of pleading this case so that the individual plaintiffs don't just allege that we are, you know, subject to climate change and climate change is going to affect everyone in a bad way, in, in a really big way, and that's our injury. Because that would be a generalized grievance under the law and that would not get you in. Right? They've said, instead they have people saying, I was in a flood in Louisiana and my house flooded. And, and as someone who was actually in that flood too, because I was driving my kid to college that week and got stuck in Lafayette, I can tell you that, is a hell, that was a hell of a flood. And they say that, and they allege that that was caused by climate change. So there's your particular injury, right? And the fact that a ton of people have similar stories to tell doesn't mean that it's not a particularized injury as long as you were injured in some way that was concrete to you. And so the district court's right about all of that. The problem is that that's over, right? That, that injury happened. We're not seeking damages. If we were seeking damages, we'd have standing to seek damages about that. And, and we, our case wouldn't be moot until we got paid, right? But they're not asking for that. They're asking for injunctive relief. And so what's happened in the past is not going to be considered relevant. What's going to, what the question is, are you likely to be subjected to this in the future? And the risk that, that these plaintiffs will be subjected to these harms in the future are the same as the risks that every one of us will be subjected to these planes in the future. Those are generalized grievances. And for that reason, I, I don't think they have standing to seek injunctive relief. I think if, if the Ninth Circuit wants to get rid of this case, it can say that and, and be on pretty solid ground. But I think the case raises um, some more difficult problems about standing and the way we do standing. Because what makes it hard to get rid of this case is that ordinarily, we accept the allegations of the complaint as true at the motion to dismiss stage. And at summary judgment stage, we have to go with the plaintiff's view as long as there's a reasonable dispute. Um, and so these, these allegations are detailed, and, and they, they say the right things. 
Um, and at the, for the summary judgment evidence, they have a lot of it. They have a lot of experts. And as long as you know, they have experts and there's experts going the other way, then this has to go to trial, right? And so you can't get rid of this simply by saying, I don't think the causation story on standing is true, or I don't think the redressability story is true, without really undermining that principle that we're not supposed to get rid of things on standing grounds simply because we're skeptical of the claim on the merit of causation, right? We don't want, you have a lot of cases where causation is difficult. Any mass tort case, it's difficult to establish. You know, did the dropping the dioxin in the water um, actually cause the plaintiff's cancers, that's a difficult causation story. And you don't say, and, and the, you might lose on causation on the merits, but you don't say you don't have standing simply because it's hard to establish causation. You take the allegations as true. My concern is that because this is such a, an ambitious, adventurous extension of that principle kind of to the logic, to its logical limits, when this, case is lo when this case loses, and, and I promise you, <laughs> it will lose on standing, um, I'm afraid we're going to undermine the basic principle that you don't you know, dismiss on standing because you, you are not willing to believe the plaintiff's story on the merits. I could see this being a case, for instance, under Twombly and Iqbal, which tightened up the federal pleading standards and saying these pleading standards aren't sufficiently, it, these, these pleadings aren't sufficiently detailed. Right, in order to pass a standing test. Um, that would have the effect not only of getting rid of this case, but also tightening up the rules and making it harder for everybody else to sue. That, in fact, is what already happened in the Iqbal case, right? which was a fanciful case on the merits under, under the Bivens cause of, a, cause of action. There was no way that those plaintiffs were going to successfully sue the Attorney General for, for these actions under the War on Terror. And the only interesting question was how they were going to lose and how bad. And in fact, that case ended up making very restrictive pleading law that now affects every plaintiff in an American court. right? And so the concern is that when this case loses, that the courts will, will tighten up the, stand, the standing rules in ways that, that undermine much more um, meritorious claims on the merits. Um, the same thing is true um, with concerns about redressability, that ordinarily your concerns about the intrusiveness of the remedy are, are supposed to be worked out at the remedy stage after the merits have been adjudicated, not at the standing stage. And yet, when remedies are really extreme, when, when people um, you know, ask the court to take over the government, as, as they basically have here, um, that tends to start infecting the standing inquiry up front. And you don't want to have too much of that, right? And so if you get an opinion you know, breathing those remedies concerns into the standing redressability um, concern up front, that's also going to tighten the rules for every other plaintiff and not just these plaintiffs. And I think that's a real concern. Um, on the merits about the substantive due process, um, here I think the, um, the district court's opinions are appalling. Um, because there's no recognition, they, they quote some very open-ended language from Obergefell about how, you know, we don't even know what rights we have and we're always learning that we have new rights. But there's no acknowledgment that the history of substantive due process is a very troubling history. And it's a history that ought to trouble progressives even more than it troubles you know, people on the right. And, and because that's the history of Lochner versus New York. That, or as I've you know, instructed my students, you always say Lochner three times. Lochner, Lochner, Lochner. This, this idea that the court should come in, you know, recognize broad rights of environmental protection that aren't in the text of the Constitution that's going to mandate all sorts of government action, um, I think that's Lochner. I think that's the court you know, formulating new rights out of whole cloth. Our experience with that is not good. Um, maybe you could, you could make an argument about how this is different. Um, the district court hasn't even acknowledged the troubling history of this and, and the, the hill that they have to get over, which is why, I mean, who knows what could happen in the Ninth Circuit? It's the Ninth Circuit. But if, the, if this claim on the merits gets to the Supreme Court, there's no way it's going to win. And again, the court might say things that would be more restrictive for more moderate claims. So the other problem on the merits is that there's no cause of action. The, the plaintiffs have been, I think, deliberately vague 
about what gives them the right to sue. Ordinarily, you would bring a case like this under the Administrative Procedure Act or something like that. They've disavowed that. Ordinarily, when you have a, a, a constitutional claim that's brought against a federal government officer, you do that under the Bivens um, case, but uh, that's usually only for damages, and it's absolutely clear that the Supreme Court is unwilling to extend that to new areas. Um, so they've been left with you know, not saying what the basis of the cause of action is, but I don't think that's a winning strategy um, in the long term. Um, so maybe I should stop there. I, I'd be happy to talk. Um, I, I think uh, it's useful to compare this case to a case like Massachusetts versus EPA, which was a much more successful effort to force the government through litigation to think hard about climate change. And maybe we can talk about that a little as we go forward, because I think that's a roadmap to how to do this right. Could I ask a very quick follow-up about <clears throat> that decision? Um, so in 2007, many of you know, some of you will not know yet, there were four votes for an opinion by um, Chief Justice Roberts to the effect that climate change is intrinsically incompatible with Article Three standing, that is, with the federal courts hearing the case at all because of the diffuse and uncertain character of the relation, um, especially between um, dispersed um, cause and harm. How likely do you think it is that this will, will force or invite the court's hand to put five votes to that conclusion? I worry that it, that it will. Um, Massachusetts versus EPA is a much more appealing case for several reasons. One is Congress had, had deliberately created a statutory right to seek judicial review of you know, the denial of a petition for rulemaking. And it accounted for a lot with the court that Congress had authorized people to bring suits like this. Um, the states were plaintiffs in that case. And one thing that's so hard about this kind of litigation is we don't know who's going to be the most affected, right? And so we're, we're aggregating very diffuse interests of, of thousands and thousands or millions of people. And there's various ways to do that in the law, none of which are entirely satisfactory in class actions, multi-district litigation, you know, other kinds of representative actions, organizational standing. States are a pretty good instrument for aggregating those diffuse interests because they have all sorts of internal checks and balances that make sure that their, that their power isn't going to be abused. Um, and they were asking for a clear remedy, right? Just, just act on the petition for review, right? They weren't saying, you know, you've got to, you know, we're gonna, we want an injunction to make the government phase out fossil fuels. So I think it, it, it posed a lot, you know, lesser separation of powers concerns. So it would be easy to distinguish Massachusetts versus EPA. My fear is that the court may not want to that bad. Um, and if that is the case, then this will be a vehicle for doing that. Um, on the other hand, if they really wanted to overrule Mass versus EPA, they could do that in a variety of cases. So I don't know how much more likely that makes it. I, I, I'm skeptical that they'll overrule that case. I think they may make it smaller by emphasizing some of the special characteristics of that case. And that might be fine. Um, you both have discussed um, discussed standing, uh, particularly within like the lens of climate change. Um, but I think that climate change also complicates this this divide between ripeness and mootness. And so I'm hoping you could talk a little bit more about um, about how the court can deal with ripeness and mootness given Giuliani. <laughs> so. Ripeness and mootness, I, I think it's best to understand them as basically standing plus time, right? You have, to, you, know, you have to have a concrete injury, in fact, in order to be the right plaintiff to sue, and you have to have it now. That's what ripeness means, and it can't go away. That's, that's what mootness means. Um, that's a little oversimplifying, but, but not that much. And so I think part of the problem is they were injured by the effects of climate change at a discrete point. You know, when their bedroom flooded in Louisiana, they they had, you know, they would have standing to seek redress for that injury. But because it's something that happens in the past, um, that's going to be moot. Now, I think, you know, what I would try to say if I were going the other way would be this is it's a basic mistake of science and policy to view these both the past threats and the future threat as unconnected. 
right? That this is, we should view this as all part of a, a general episode, an ongoing set of harms, that the earth is warming, and that was just the beginning to that party, right? And, and I think that very well may be right in some general sense, but I think that also puts a lot of pressure on the ability of courts to deal with this sort of thing, right? That, in the beginning of the, uh, when, when, the, when the government moved for, to dismiss, it moved to dismiss on political question grounds. And the district court said, no, this isn't a political question under the traditional criteria in Baker versus Carr. And I think it was absolutely right about that. But there's a broader sense in which there are political questions. And that is that some problems are just not neatly susceptible to judicial resolution because they're so amorphous, because they're so large, because they implicate so many different interests. Um, and usually the way we know that there are the sort of political questions that have that form is because we can't find a, a plaintiff withstanding or we can't fit it into our traditional structure of ripeness and moodness and all that. I, I think all of that is a clue, not that we need to change the ripeness and moodness and, and standing rules to accommodate a case like this, but this, this, this is a case that you probably ought to think of as a political question in that broader sense. I wonder whether I could <clears throat> talk a little about the um, question of time and push back against my own earlier contrarianism about the case. Um, because we're, we're so much in harmony that I now have to disagree a little <laughs> bit with myself, uh, more, more than with Professor Young. Um, to my mind, one of the best accounts of where the Supreme Court should and shouldn't involve itself in the use of constitutional review to override or go outside the democratic political process is in those cases where the interests that are centrally concerned are foreseeably and persistently likely to be neglected in the political process or subordinated. This account arose out of the rationalization of the civil rights era for obvious reasons. <clears throat> you have sort of identifiable, subordinated minority populations. The political process by itself isn't adequately remedying their situation. The court can involve itself and ensure that their rights get a more adequate airing. That, that's the sort of <clears throat> optimal account of it. So future generations are a perfect instance, in some ways, of this argument, because they are um, always asymmetrically positioned in relation to us. Anything we do on their behalf, we will bear the cost of, but not be around to have the benefit of. Um, and they can't put any pressure on us to do anything about, about it. Um, so one of, uh, one of a few things needs to happen. One would be the development of uh, more robust, conservative ethic of the kind that Edmund Burke, who's a <clears throat> favorite of Professor Young's, and also my favorite conservative, one of them. Um, <laughs> you're another of them. Um, <clears throat> said about how the generations ought to regard one another as in a kind of continuous link of mutual obligation. That's not the exact phrasing, but it's the spirit of it. Um, an another um, complementary approach is that we need institutions that are basically tasked with speaking to the interests of future generations so we don't neglect them. Given what we've now got, the court seems the, the better of the branches <laughs> to ask to do that. And yet there are so many problems with trying actually to get an answer out of them, uh, both at the, um, as it were, abstract level, what kind of problem this is and how well it fits into what we think of as the competence of the courts, and also from the point of view of their pure um, capacity to make something stick. I think part of the reason this will lose is that the justices, if it gets to that point, won't think it makes sense or belongs. On some level, a part of the reason it will lose is that this kind of thing done up against the resistance of the majoritarian institutions would break the courts if it were frequently, if it were frequently involved. I don't disagree with much of that at all. Um, 
one thing I like about Massachusetts versus EPA, um, obviously as a scholar of federalism, is that it emphasizes the role of the states as plaintiffs in cases like this. And I think the, the states not only aggregate lots of people in the here and now, but they are institutions that you know, extend way back into the future. You know, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has been here from the beginning. It's been here longer than the, the federal government has been here. And so you know, it's you know, institutions like that that expect to be around for a really long time are pretty good institutions to um, take the long view. And while they are dominated by the voters of the president, you know, just empirically, we see states taking the long view and, and representing those very, very long-term interests. And, you know, and to the extent that we're worried that this is getting into too political an area, I think it helps that they are political institutions, right? They, they've got, the, the Attorney General of, the, of Massachusetts, Maura Healy, has to go back and face the voters um, and get reelected, and they will be, be judging her in part on whether her litigation strategy, suing the Trump administration 15 times in the first year of its, it, it was in office, um, whether that was a responsible use of state resources and an appropriate thing to do. And so it doesn't worry me so much that we're moving into the political sphere because we have political actors that are politically accountable playing that role in, in the judicial sphere. So I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing I would say is I, I do think that we should rely more on courts to resolve some of the issues that are dividing us. So this is a fight I have had with Walter Dellinger over the Texas immigration case when they sued to challenge the, the DACA policy of the um, Obama administration. And the argument was made, well, that's, that's just a political fight. You're continuing this in the, in the courts. And, but the thing was, it was a legal fight, too. There were legal standards that, that governed that question. And the alternative is often to just have these really ugly political fights where, for instance, Congress can't, pass, can't get a statute it likes past the president's veto, but and so it holds the debt ceiling hostage or confirmations hostage. And, and, and each branch is using their political weapons to fight these political fights. I'm not sure that's better for the republic than having a court resolve at least the underlying legal issues. And I think in a lot of places, a lot of issues that can be done. Um, I think this one is too big, um, and the remedy is too big, and, and it will break the courts if, if they try. Um, I think you know, um, the clinic's version of this suit, um, is what, to the extent that I understand it, is the sane version of Juliana, right? It's, it's the, the helpful version um, of this sort of argument. So I, I think we ought to hear a little more about that. Not that I'm calling on you or anything. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I signed up for that gig when I agreed to uh, well, participate in this, so thank you very much. And you're definitely one of my favorite conservatives as well. <laughs> um, let me just go ahead and say that I think that, that to the extent there's similarity between what we have worked for on behalf of Hallie Turner, Emily Liu, and Aria Pontula, uh, that's similar with the Juliana plaintiffs on behalf of the clinic is basically one fundamental question, which is, can the social contract be sociopathic? And to the extent that it is, do the courts have a role to play in correcting the other branches of government in, in regard to their relative inaction in relation to the scope of the problem? Now, in our case, we are actually doing things, as the United States would probably say, certainly right. That is, we are particularly going with a specific regulatory proposal to a state-level agency to regulate sources of emissions over which the state clearly has regulatory control. We've asked for a carbon dioxide budget to be established by the state of North Carolina. We recognize that North Carolina, as a state's carbon dioxide emissions, have hopefully already peaked. They certainly are heading in the, in the correct direction. Um, the question is, will they head in the correct direction quickly enough? And the other more important question is, will the, the, the incentives and the changes that we see in the North Carolina energy system be replicated globally? Will the other 50 states follow that lead? Will the other nations around the world follow that lead? Will we all get to where we need to get soon enough to avoid catastrophic result? And so we have presented that petition, that single action, under our Administrative Procedure Act. It was rejected by the North Carolina Environmental Management Commission. And so um, students had been working on that for several semesters to prepare that document. 
now Marnisha Jernigan in the front row here, raise your hand Marnisha if you don't mind, is helping me um, prepare some legal arguments there. And our primary legal arguments are actually very specific um, tactical type arguments related to the Administrative Procedures Act of North Carolina. But behind all of that is this fundamental question, is there a duty on the part of the political branches, as hard as it is, to tackle climate change, to tackle it? And if they fail to do so, at what point and using what mechanism can they be held to account? Certainly Massachusetts versus EPA suggests, and I certainly agree with you, um, when that case came out, I thought in many ways, based on the parents' patriae standing, that there was a real uh, possibility there um, for states to come forward and take that role. Um, I would say this, that, that I have noticed that whatever court we find ourselves in, there is an opposition that says we're in the wrong court. So there's an element here of hide the pee. Um, there's this great scene in Kung Fu Panda, one of my favorite um, things of all time, when, uh, when Poe, the protagonist, uh, is trying to flee uh, the villainous um, uh, the oppressor who is coming to take it away from him, and he's got the dragon scroll, and he sees the way to get the, the, um, his, um, his opponent is too strong. So the way to stop him is to throw all these walks out in, and then he puts the dragon scroll under one of the walks and plays like 20-card Monty with all of these little walks going around. And that's how it feels here. You go to the EMC, and they say, well, we can't do anything about that. That's the U.S. government. Go talk to them. We go to the U.S. government. They say, well, we can't do anything about that. Go talk go to the APA and talk to the individual decisions. And I think, I think Aiken, Judge Aiken had one good answer in, in to some of what was said here. And, and, and I, I want to say it's not an answer, it's a response to some of the concerns that I've heard. One is, is that the APA is kind of inappropriate here for the following reason. Plaintiffs do not contend that any single agency action is causing their asserted injuries, nor could they, given the complex chain of causation involved in climate change. They seek review of aggregate action by multiple agencies something the APA's judicial review provisions do not address. The APA does not govern plaintiff's claims. Then she goes on to point out that the court acknowledges that the allocation of power among the branches of government is a critical consideration in this case and reiterate that, quote, should plaintiffs prevail on the merits, the court would no doubt be compelled to exercise great care to avoid separation of powers problems in crafting a remedy. I think those problems that, that um, Professor um, was, um, uh, was Young was talking about are, are very present. We do need to think about those, whether they are strict separation of powers or maybe separation of powers with an asterisk, larger questions are there. Um, they asked for a lot of different claims for relief. In our case, we're asking for a much more circumscribed claim for relief. We're just asking to start rulemaking on this carbon budget rule. And then once that rulemaking starts, the hope is that that might lead to something. But we also recognize that it's highly likely that that might lead to nothing because we've had inaction at the, um, at least in, in this particular branch, the Environmental Management Commission for all these years. So that's a short sort of segue back into talking about Juliana, which is that at the state level, I think it is critically important that those of us who have an opportunity do file actions that are circumscribed, that uh, are um, maybe not as creative uh, as the Juliana action, but that are aiming in, in the portion of the, of the bigger picture that we can control um, to try and make sure that we hold that um, social contract to account. And that's where the public trust doctrine, I think, comes in, is just this notion of does the United States or does any state government hold that, hold that responsibility? And, and as opposed to a discretionary duty, is that a mandatory duty? And that was an, a really interesting question we had earlier uh, before we started. So one moral of the story is that everyone who's interested in this sort of thing needs to take federal courts so that when Poe puts the P under the walks, you'll know which one to turn over. <laughs> That's right. I think you just implicated a really interesting nuance of this case because the youth plaintiffs are asserting um, a claim under the public trust doctrine, but typically the public trust doctrine is um, deployed at the state level. And so I was hoping you could both talk a little bit about um, the merits of using this at the national level, given that climate change and CO2 emissions are inherently national, even international. Yeah. <clears throat> so there hasn't generally been thought to be um, a doctrine obliging the federal government to steward or conserve common resources on behalf of the whole population, which is the basic principle that the public trust doctrine applies via the courts in a variety of states to, like I said, a specific and historically bounded set of resources, especially certain waters. 
Um, there has been a moment <clears throat> in US law when some people imagined that the public trust doctrine might be blown up into an entirely different kind of thing and become the basis of environmental law, generally. Um, environmental law as it now exists was basically invented in the early 1970s. There was really no such thing before that. And one of the first um, shots across the bow in creating it was a very famous argument by a law professor called Joe Sachs, um, which essentially argued that the public trust doctrine should be deployed by the courts um, at all levels to require governments at all levels to take care of all kinds of interdependent, ecologically sensitive resources on behalf of the whole population. This, um, in 1969, emerged from the um, flush of, of optimism about what courts could do at the sort of tail end of the civil rights revolution. Uh, and it was preempted almost immediately by Congress passing a raft of environmental statutes that basically created the institutional framework of modern environmental law and passing those by um, enormous majorities. Um, kind of, so, so that they, they look like typographical mistakes when you look at the votes on the major environmental laws. 300 something to three. Um, so, uh, it's, the reason I point to this is that this was a moment when the sense of crisis around the first generation of environmental problems widespread pollution, um, <coughs> habitat degradation, mass extinction, was seen as presenting a real gap between what needed to happen and what was getting done. And people started to look to the courts and look to the courts to act creatively. And then the political branches stepped in. They took dramatic action. And <coughs> the impetus to look to the courts went away. We may be waiting a lot longer for um, dramatic or adequate political action now. And if that's true, I think there's going to continue to be pressure to try to remake old doctrines and familiar institutional forms to get more leverage out of the courts on climate change. Um, and so then the question is going to become one of, um, of judgment about what will work institutionally and conceptually and why. And so at that point, I get this the bottom line. I don't think we need to be confidently um, sort of committed to what the old boundaries of the public trust doctrine have been. The public trust doctrine can change, as common law doctrines can, um, can change in dramatic ways. But I think we do need to take very, very seriously the more specific prudential judgments that we've both talked about, but Professor Young especially has emphasized about what will what will actually make incremental progress and what will risk bigger forms of backlash? Should we go? I, I don't want to. That's fine. Up. Yep. Do you, let's open up the room for any questions if anybody would like to pose any. Or surely. So that's going to affect a lot of people. And we probably don't know exactly which people in exactly what way yet. Um, and that's what makes it a generalized grievance, right? That, that's what makes it not particularized as to particular people. Now, I suppose if you could find someone who, you know, the, the water was already lapping at the foundation of the house, and you could say that, you know, this, this has been, you would have to establish that that was caused by climate change and not by just some other hydrological phenomenon. Um, then you could say it's part of an ongoing process, and I, th and I think that would be the strongest case that you can make. Um, you know, it's the fact that it might be thousands of people you know, it wouldn't matter because it was particularly affecting your house. You know, just because a lot of other people are also hurt in the same way, your injury is particularized to you. So I think that, you know, that would be the best 
that, that's the best case scenario, I think. Um, but I don't know how, how well they can make that case. Like Louisiana actually bought in the floodplain map and said, hey, we as a whole state have a, a problem. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why it was great for Massachusetts, because Massachusetts had standing not only on behalf of its citizens, but also as an owner of public lands, right? They, they were able to say, we've got this thing called Cape Cod, and it ain't none of it very high above seawater, and, and, it, and we really like it out there, and you know, our, our maps are going to look funny if it just all gets submerged, and we will, we will certainly be injured. But, but what's great about the state is it aggregates so many interests that we know that it will be affected for sure. It, it becomes less probabilistic. Um, so I think that, that, that's helpful. Uh, first, I want to thank you for such an interesting uh, and thoughtful discussion of this case. And to me, one of the most interesting aspects is, the, is what would happen at the remedy stage, even if the plaintiffs were able to get past standing and the and the other uh, stages that we, you've been discussing, what would they win? And um, it may be very difficult for a court to order a national remedial plan. Or, and I thought it was interesting that Mike Longus talked about asking the state to do specific things under, perhaps even under current statutory authority. So that leads me to the question, not only of, in a legal or formal matter, what could a federal court order the US government to do? But also, back to the litigation strategy and the question of, is this political theater or is the gap between the charisma and the legal practicality, or the gap between the moral claim, the urgency of the issue, and what the political institutions are really doing and what future generations could get the future the, the political institutions to do, that could um, could the plaintiffs here uh, win even if they lose, in the sense that their real attempt is to raise the public profile of this issue, much as some of the earlier litigation, environmental and mass tort litigation did, even though they lost. Uh, even in the dioxin cases like Agent Orange, arguably the, the plaintiffs didn't get that much, but they, then they got Congress to change veterans' benefits in a, in a bigger way. So could the plaintiffs here be... Um, gaining through promoting future legislative change, even if they lose this specific case. Arguably, that was the Obama administration's initial gambit with the Clean Power Plan. They didn't really want the Clean Power Plan. They wanted to threaten costly action that Congress would then pass a better climate statute. And so that could be a similar strategy here. But on the other hand, could this case backfire and, as you were saying, you know, result in an opinion that restricts standing that for, for all cases and so forth. So I'm wondering about your thought about the litigation strategy, given that the remedy seems so difficult. I think that's a, an admirable summary of all the things we think. About the case. <laughs> um, and I think an ambitious remedy would be what would break, what would break the court in political resistance. And all the other gaming out, I think, is, is consonant with what what, what the federal district courts did in the school desegregation cases was basically to put southern school districts in receivership, you know? and, and not just southern ones. But, but, but you can do that to a school district. You know, it's harder to do that to the entire ex executive branch and the legislative branch, right? Um, the, you know, Judge, Judge Garrity took over Boston Harbor. And, and it put that into receivership for a bit, you know, in an environmental case. Um, there's a photo, apparently, of him on the cover of the American Lawyer, I think, um, you know, floating in the waters of the bay in his robes, billowing out around him. Because he was, he was the czar of, of Boston Harbor, because he was ruling it all through injunction, right? And you can do that on a local scale. I, I, but I just, it's very hard to see that happening um, at the national level, this is not, I mean, I would compare this to Thurgood Marshall's strategy on um, race, where you know, they wanted to win cases and establish incrementally legal principles that would in inexorably get you to Brown, and it, and it worked beautifully. Um, this is a very different strategy from that, right? This is, we're going to lose, but we're going to get past motion for summary judgment, which they did, and we're going to get to put the government on trial and make them look terrible. And... So, so that might be great theater. You might actually take some hits on the doctrine. You have to weigh those things against each other. I just wonder how 
how necessary, I think it might have been really helpful to have that trial 10 years ago. Um, do you need it now? Because I, I, the most encouraging thing in this picture is, uh, you know, it, back, Jonathan, when you and I were debating and making crazy debate arguments in college and high school, we used to talk about the environmental ethic, right, and how nothing could, would get solved until the ethic of society changes. And, and I think it is changing, which is remarkable. I thought those, those arguments were crazy back in the day, uh, but it is changing. And so I, I don't know that you need this trial to, to speed that along. I think that's starting to happen on its own. I know some folks have class, um, but I want to thank everybody for, for coming and asking questions and engaging with this conversation today. So, um, yeah.